We've now looked in detail how to make maximum entropy classifiers, and what I want to do in this segment is extend from there to show how we can build sequence models out of classifiers. In particular, we are going to make maximum entropy sequence models. Many problems in NLP have data which is a sequence of something. It might be a sequence of characters, a sequence of words, a sequence of phrases, a sequence of lines, paragraphs, sentences. And we can think of the task, perhaps with a little coding, as one of labeling each item. So a very straightforward example is part of speech tagging that we just looked at. So here we have the words, and for each word we're going to label it with a particular part of speech. Other examples are fairly straightforward as well. So for named entity recognition, here we have the word, and we're going to label it with an entity if it is one like organization, or if it's not an entity, we're going to label it with an O. Some other cases of things that can be done as sequence problems, it's a little bit subtle to think about the encoding, but is actually quite straightforward once you've worked through the ideas. So here we have a piece of Chinese text, and what we want to do is word segmentation. So this is a word, this is a second word, this is a third word, this is a fourth word, this is a single character word, and so on. And what we can do is we can use a labeling to capture that. So here we have what's called BI labeling, um, where we're distinguishing just two states, begin and inside. And that's sufficient to represent tasks like word segmentation. So this says this is the beginning of a new word, but then the next token says it's also the beginning of a new word. So we start a word here, but then we've got this I class, so we continue, another I class, we continue, so that's a three character word, and then we go back to a B and we start a new word, which is a two character word. So although really we're segmenting the characters into subsequences, we can encode the decisions we have to make by regarding the problem as a sequence labeling task. Here's one more slightly different example. So what we have here is a stretch of text, and we can think of the text as lines of an old-fashioned file where hard line breaks or sentences. And so what this is is an FAQ, as you find commonly on websites. And what we want to do is to automatically process it and to work out where are the questions and where are the answers. And so we're going to regard that as a sequence labeling task where each of our items is representing a line or a sentence. And so then we're encoding our decisions using exactly the same kind of two-class classification over here. So each line has been classified as either a question line or an answer line. And then we have the answer lines grouped together for a particular answer. So what we're going to do um, with our maximum entropy models is we're going to put them into a sequence model. And these are usually referred to as maximum entropy Markov models, MEMMs, or conditional Markov models. So what the classifier does is it makes a single decision at a time, but it's able to be conditioned on evidence both from observations and from previous decisions. So here we're showing a picture, we're in the middle of doing part of speech tagging, and we've already given part of speech tags to the first three words. And so we're proceeding left to right, and that what we're up to is giving a part of speech tag for this word here. And so the idea is, for features for classification, we're going to be able to use features of the current word, we're going to be able to use features of other words if we wish, but we're also going to be allowed to use features of the previously assigned part of speech tag, perhaps the part of speech tag, two backwards, and all of these can influence the classification. And so that's what's being shown over here for our features. So we have current word, next word, previous word, um, previous tag, previous two tags taken jointly as a feature. And then we can also define other features of the kind that we've discussed before. So here we have a has digit feature of the current word, which is being used to generalize over different numbers, because maybe we don't know very much or anything about the number 22.6 in particular. So generalizing a little, this is the picture of how we move from our basic maxent classifier to a sequence model. So overall, we have sequence data here, 
and what we want to do is classification at the sequence level. So we have individual words or characters and we want to assign to them their classes. But the way we're going to do that is we're going to look at each decision individually. So we're going to say, okay, there's a particular classification of interest, this one here. And how are we going to make that classification? Well, what we're going to do is say for that particular classification, there's data locally of interest to it. So there's the current word, the previous word, the previous class. And so what we're going to do is we're going to do feature extraction over that data. And so we have the label that we're trying to predict or which we can see in supervised training data. We've got features of the observed data in previous classifications. And then we're building a maximum entropy model over that. And so at that point, we're doing all the stuff that we've talked about. We're doing optimization of a model. We're doing smoothing. And at the end of the day, we build a little local classifier that makes the individual decisions. So what we'll do is we'll do it at this position, but then we'll repeat the same thing over at the next position and we'll go along taking our sequence. It's extremely easy to see how to do that in one way where we first of all decide this label, then we go on to decide this label, and then this label, this label, and at each point we can use preceding labels to help determine the next one. And if we do that, we have a greedy sequence modeler that's just deciding one sequence at a time and moving on. That in many applications actually works quite well, but commonly people want to explore the search space a little bit better because sometimes, although here you might decide one part of speech tag is best, that later on, once you've looked over here, that that would give some reason to think that maybe you should have chosen differently back over here. And so there are a couple of methods that are commonly used to do that. One method is beam inference. So at beam inference, at each position, rather than just assigning the most likely label, we can keep several possibilities. So we might keep the top K complete subsequences up to the point where we're at so far. And so then at each stage, we'll consider each partial subsequence and extend it to one further position. Now, beam inference is also very fast and easy to implement. And it turns out that a lot of the time that beam sizes of three or five give you enough maintenance of a few possibilities and works almost as well as doing exact inference to find the best possible state sequence and it's easy to implement. Of course, that's not necessarily true. You get no guarantees that you found the globally best part of speech tag sequence or whatever your sequence problem is. And it can certainly be the case that possibilities that would later have been shown to be good might fall off the beam before they get to be shown to be good. We can do better than that. We can actually find the best sequence of states that has the globally highest score in the model. And doing that is referred to an NLP as doing Viterbi inference, um, since um, Andrew Viterbi invented a lot of these algorithms finding um, the best way of doing things. Viterbi inference is a form of dynamic programming, or you can also think of it as memorization. And you can do this kind of dynamic programming providing you have a small window of state influence. So for example, when you're trying to decide this um, label, if it depends on words however it wants to, but only depends on, say, the previous label and the one before that, then you end up with this sort of fixed small window of stuff you need to know about to make decisions, and nothing back here is affecting what decision you make. Providing that's true, you can write dynamic programming algorithms to find the optimal state sequence. And so that has the obvious advantage that you're guaranteed to find the best state sequence, but it has some disadvantages. It requires a bit more work to implement, and it forces you to restrict your use of previous labels in your inference process to a fixed small window. That is a restriction, but a lot of the time it's not such a bad restriction because in practice um, it's hard to get long distance 
interactions to be working effectively anyway, even in something like a beam model, which does allow long distance interactions. Okay, I've introduced maximum entropy Markov models, and I hope that you now feel that you understand them and will be able to build them as an assignment. Before I end, I should just very briefly mention conditional random fields. So conditional random fields are another probabilistic sequence model. And if you just sort of look big picture in the math of a, a conditional random field, boy, that equation looks exactly like the equation that we've been staring at in all of the recent slides. The difference with conditional random fields is that these probabilities are in terms of the entire sequences. So this is the sequence of classes and the sequence of observed data values, that it's not in terms of particular points in that space. And so we get this whole sequence conditional model rather than a chaining of local models. That looks as if it would be very difficult to deal with because the space of a sequence of C's is exponential in its length and the space of a sequence of data items represented as features is at a minimum huge and perhaps even infinite. Um, but it turns out that providing the FI features remain local, permitting dynamic programming, that the conditional sequence likelihood can be calculated exactly. Um, training is somewhat slower, but CRFs have theoretical advantages of avoiding certain causal competition biases that can occur with maximum entry Markov models. However, to explain the details of these models, we'd have to go quite a way afield looking at, in general, how to do Markov random field inference, which is, I feel is a better topic for other courses. So let me just mention these and say that these days, using CRFs or variants of them that use a max margin criterion coming out of SVMs are seen as the state-of-the-art method for doing sequence models and there are various bits of software including um, the Stanford software for named entity recognition you can download that implement CRFs. But a thing to know is that although CRFs are theoretically cleaner and can avoid some problems of MEMMs, that in practice when you're building models with rich features which condition on observed data both before and after you, that in practice they tend to have performance that can't really be distinguished from maximum entropy Markov models. And so there's really no problem with using maximum entropy Markov models to do the job of sequence classification, and that's what we'll use in the assignment. Okay, and so I hope that you guys now have a concrete idea of how you can build a maxent classifier and then incorporate it into a system for doing sequence inference.